When I travel, one thing I am very fond of doing is visiting interesting old cemeteries. So much history is found there just in the names and the dates that one reads. Sometimes the monuments themselves are fascinating works of art that tell a story. In almost no other country in the world is this more so than in Russia. In Moscow, tourists stand for hours in Red Square, waiting to visit the strikingly ugly tomb of Lenin to see what is supposed to be the embalmed body of a man who has been lying in state for a hundred years. I skipped that. To the side of Lenin's tomb, interred in the Kremlin Wall necropolis, are the remains of the other significant Soviet politicians, scientists, cosmonauts. The cult of the body was remarkable in a regime that had no interest in the soul. I skipped that too. But no visitor to Moscow should neglect a visit to another special cemetery housed in the Novodevichy convent. This is the city's third most popular tourist attraction, and deservedly so. Since the 19th century, it has been the resting place for countless famous people. Here we find the great writers, Chekhov, Mayakovsky, Bulgakov, and Gogol, composers Prokopiev and Shostakovich, and the great film director Eisenstein. Many of the monuments are spectacular works of art themselves, suited to the personalities and achievements of their occupants. A day there is like a day spent in a world-class art museum. For me, though, the most fascinating grave there is that of Nikita Khrushchev, the famous leader of the Soviet Union during much of the Cold War. It's not his personality that attracts me and so many others, but rather his monument and its striking depiction of the soul of this man. As you face the monument, the left side is a jagged column of three white marble blocks, while the right side is an equally jagged column of three black granite slabs. The two sides collide, interlocking in a stark cubist formation, and together they hold up the bronze head of Khrushchev. This striking design portrays the conflicted duality of the man's character, the internal contradiction and eternal conflict within his soul. Here is the bright progressive reformer who exposed Stalin's crimes and closed down the gulags. Yet this side of him is painfully intertwined with the dark side of him, the reactionary, shoe-banging side that reverted to brutal tactics and encouraged the building of the Berlin Wall. These two sides of him come into stark collision, neither blending nor reconciling. But they are both equally a part of him. His head rests on the bright, but is enveloped in the dark. Here was a man caught up between good and bad. Is this not the very realistic depiction of the soul of every human being? Are we not all caught up in the yin and yang, the eternal struggle between our darker side and what Abraham Lincoln famously christened the better angels of our nature? Who here could truthfully be sculpted as one side without the other? The celebration of Corpus Christi is the celebration of that great body of humankind to which by virtue of our humanity we belong and of which by virtue of our faith we are aware. It is the recognition of the good, the heroic, the loving, the Christ right inside of us. 
that part pulling us onward and upward to soar to the new heights of which we are capable. We sometimes call that grace. But it is also the recognition that we are surrounded by other elements, weaker parts of that same humanity of ours, which struggle to keep us down. We sometimes call that sin. And there we are, like the bust of Khrushchev, perched between the two, held up by one perhaps, but enveloped by the other. There are those who see the world in terms of black and white, good and evil, right and wrong. They divide the world into us guys and those guys. Of course, us guys are the good and those guys are the bad. Us guys are right and those guys are wrong. Always. Those with such a vision are known as fundamentalists. They exist in every religion, and indeed even among those with no religion. For them there can be no tolerance of anything other than what they see themselves to be, because they see only one color of marble at a time and they have inflicted an incredible amount of harm on the world because of their vision, or rather lack of it. It is a very dangerous thing among warring peoples to claim to have God on your side, because then you will stop at nothing. Both sides of all wars have always done this. The horrors committed in the name of God have been innumerable, and they continue in our age. As Mahatma Gandhi so aptly put it, the most heinous and the most cruel crimes of which history has record have been committed under the cover of religion or equally noble motives. The history of nearly every religion the story of every people bears out the truth of his statement. The problem is not God. The problem is not religion. The problem is fundamentalism. I am right and you are wrong. Our wise Holy Father, Pope Francis, is keenly aware of this and has condemned fundamentalism in all religions including our own, as a form of violence. A fundamentalist group, says the Holy Father, even if it kills no one, even if it strikes no one, is violent. The mental structure of fundamentalism is violence in the name of God. We would stop seeing the world as divided into two opposing sides, if we could just open our eyes to the various sides within our own selves, if we could recognize our own imperfections side by side with our perfections, our own confusion side by side with our enlightenment, our own ignorance side by side with our wisdom, as individuals and as church, we are called by the Holy Father, called by all true prophets, to a humility of vision. On the feast of Corpus Christi, we literally carry the Christ into the streets, but we do so with very imperfect hands, very human hands. There is much in ourselves and in our history of which we can be quite proud. But there is also much which should make us shudder. As the body of Christ, we are called to constant renewal, as the Council reminds us. It may be the body of Christ, but every body is in constant need of washing and a mirror held up to it from time to time. When I looked at that monument to Khrushchev, 
with its two completely different sides. I saw not the face of the dead Russian leader, but my own. Let us dare to open our eyes to humanity's bright corners as well as its dreadful shadow, and to recognize there not two distinct windows, one through which to admire another person, and the other through which to throw a stone of derision. But rather, let us recognize there one single perfect mirror of our own mysterious, many-faceted, beautiful, and terrifying human soul.